Hi there, everyone. It's me, Michael, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke assaulter. Um, yes, again, uh, there's been a protracted absence, and I'm going to explain that in this video completely. Um, this video is intended for an adult audience. This video is going to provoke and present emotions. This video may cause anxiety and thoughts. So let me just say this right now. This video will be triggering um, for some people for various reasons. So if um, at any point during this video you feel you need to go and physically get help, um, do it. Just do it. Um, again, you're going to find someone you trust. You're going to grab them in an all-round bear hug grasp, and you're, you're going to demand that they take you to help. So... That being said, um, a comment got left on my channel yesterday, and it was on the video I did two years ago on self-harm and suicide after stroke, and, and I'm quite surprised the videos are still getting a limited amount of traction after two years. I realize I only have 352-ish subscribers, and thank you, each and every one of you. Um, yeah, I'm going to get back on the wagon, per se. So... The comment Linda left, and hi, Linda. Um, I'm sorry we had to meet this way. Her comment is, Recently, a friend of ours took her own life after being released from the hospital after a stroke. She was under 40. It is so sad that upon being released, the doctors and nurses, no one spoke with the family about this issue. Yeah, they don't. Um, they did set her up with a counselor who didn't answer the phone the day she pulled the trigger. Uh, that's sad. Uh, on, on many reasons. I'm sorry you've had to endure the passing of a friend. Um, <clears throat> I, I can only imagine how um, distressing that must be. Um, I have some insight into why your friend might have done it. Uh, I can't speak for everyone in all, all situations. So this video is going to be um, suicide after stroke, my personal journey. So full disclosure, if you know me personally, do not leave a comment on the video because I will delete it. Um, call me. I have a mobile right here. Right? You should know the number or you have another way to get in contact with me, email, Facebook, whatever, right? Um, get on get on the comms and let's chat. So uh, for anyone in a professional relationship that might know me, be that my former therapists, um, being Danielle and Michaela, uh, Jen, my current therapist, and my psychiatrist, no worries, we are good, right? So no need to come track me now. Although you find people all know where I live or how to get in contact with me. So moving on. Suicide after stroke, it's, it's, it's not talked about. Um, I was told you're going to get better and get out of the hospital, essentially. I was sent home. There was no mental health intervention set up whatsoever. Um, I realized month monthish after my stroke I self referred to Michaela my first therapist wonderful lady skilled therapist um, truly beautiful person and she helped me as much as she could uh, I then had to convince my family doctor I say the word convince um, that I needed some additional help uh, he then referred me to um, another service. I did a group session work for people with PTSD because of the stroke I have PTSD. For other reasons I have PTSD, which we will cover some of which during this video. Um, I then went to PTSD therapy for 12-ish, 13-ish sessions. Um, I've seen a couple of OTs. I'm currently seeing a therapist or social worker right now. I see her at least twice a week, once kind of informally at a social kind of group and once formally for like an actual appointment <clears throat> and then I have my wonderful therapist or sorry psychiatrist um, 
he's truly skilled, and I'm indebted to him because he saved my life. Uh, at the time I was seeing someone, she's an amazing lady, she also saved my life. So, after my stroke, I started a return to work process, which was, in my opinion, my observation, my judgment, completely flawed. Uh, I say that because I currently have a legal action against my current, soon-to-be former employer, about the shitty things that happened during that return to work process. Um, slightly before my stroke, uh, the person in charge of the site that I'm at, I was at, uh, made reference to my value being that of one used sock and 13 golf balls in an email that went pretty much company-wide. After my stroke, he referred to me in a birthday card as having the value of a pack of cigarettes, actually a pack of smokes. Um, so that has caused me some angst. Um, the whole, there's other pieces in there as well, uh, in the whole return to work piece where, um, and it's, it's too long to get into it and I'm really not going to get into all of it because I could pontificate for hours on the shit that happened. So, and again, this is my observation, my judgment, my opinion. This is based on everything that I've experienced. And I have actual evidence that happened. I have the physical copies of these things. Um, so you can't say that it didn't happen. It's a fact. These things happened. So because of what happened in my workplace, um, I was forced to go seek a, um, a leave for chronic mental health issues. My doctor at the time said my issues are not scientific. Um, he then signed a form saying he was going to refer me to a psychiatrist. He never did. I know that. Because of his inaction, I was forced to go to the emergency room in crisis to see what was going on. And I was told in the emergency room that he'd never made a referral. Um, and it's not like a week gap here. This is almost a two-month gap between the day he signed a form saying he was going to refer me to the day I presented in the emergency room. Um, and, and that was, I, I was released on what's called a safety plan. Um, I still have one. It's on my fridge. Um, maybe I can do a video about the safety plan, right? So we can, we can talk about that. Um, part of that safety plan was I got an immediate appointment with a psychiatrist. I'm not going to name him. I don't have that permission, but he's in my city and he's an amazing man. Um, and, um, I also was required to go to a three week outpatient hospital mental health day program. Great staff. I can't, can't really talk about it because it was, a group, it was a group thing. So I can't really say much about it because I would be giving up the, possibly the confidence of others. Um, and I'm not going to do that. Um, and then fast forward a couple of months after that, uh, due to the workplace um, events, I was sent by the what's called the Workplace Insurance Safety Board of Ontario to go for a neuropsychological assessment in December of 2019. Um, that became very triggering and I became suicidal. Uh, in fact, I was having extreme suicidal ideations uh, on the way home from that trip. I thought about kissing the third rail on the TTC, um, knowing full well that would just fucking kill me. Um, I got back to my city. Uh, the next day, I was extremely suicidal. And my girlfriend had to, my girlfriend at the time, had to take me to the hospital. And she actually told the doctors, you're going to have to check him in because she could not keep me alive herself. I still hear that sentence ring in my head occasionally, and it, I, it, it, it just, yeah. So because of that, I was then um, voluntarily, voluntarily um, admitted to the psychiatric unit, uh, and I was there for five days, I think five days. Um, I came home, my medication got adjusted. Uh, Fast forward again to June, so it's almost a year after I've left work. Um, I then had to be what was called formed. 
Uh, in England, you would call it sectioning. In the province of Ontario, we call it formed. So I was I was formed um, as I was a danger to myself or others, and I was in the hospital, quote unquote, against my will, um, for six days. Now, I wasn't completely psychotic. I wasn't having like a break from reality. Um, it just I was circling the fucking toilet. Let's just be honest here. Um, my brain was taking me to incredibly dark, shitty, scary fucking places and things were going to happen. That's, that's about as simple as it gets. Um, and because of that, I was, uh, I ended up at the hospital. Um, I ended up being formed and my psychiatrist and I had a great conversation about what was happening. He's like, I'm going to form you. And I'm like, okay. He goes, you can argue this. I'm like, no. Um, you know, we had a, probably a 30 minute, 35 minute conversation about being formed. Um, and I knew full well that what was happening, cause I used to work in mental health. So I, I knew I was going to get a three day form. Um, he could have put me in a 10 day, which could have, um, I was actually quite surprised he didn't, but he put me in a three day. And then we just quietly agreed that he'll let the form run out and I agree to stay until he says I'm allowed to go home or he'll form me. It was kind of the gist of that conversation. Um, my medication got adjusted yet again. So have I been suicidal? I've had thoughts. Yeah, I've, I've completely had thoughts. Um, have I committed to a gesture? Not recently. Um, not that would cause anyone any concern. So one of the reasons why I've been away is because of my mental health. It, it just fucking sucks. <laughs> yeah, my mental health is horrible. But I saw that comment and I just I just couldn't let it slide and not acknowledge it and and just it's hard for me because someone left a comment and I, I'll address this in a, in a in a video shortly that you look forward to my videos and you, you've been hanging on my words and, and I'm a role model I, I'll be honest I don't feel like a role model some days um, partly because of sort of the situation I'm in. Um, and that, that, that's a many layered thing, kind of like an onion. So suicide after stroke, there's, there's many reasons why, um, you could be unhappy about your physical state. You know, you can't move part of your body. Um, you now have to wear a diaper or you now have to have a, um, like a colonoscopy or a, um, a catheter. Uh, you can't tie your shoes at all. Like that's never going to happen. You can't walk, you know, um, I still have speech problems. I still occasionally have foot drop. Um, bright lights are getting better ish. Still not that happy with fluorescent lights for long periods of time. I still can't handle noise. So if like there's a radio playing in the background, I still can't handle that. My brain just goes nuts. Um, I have my mobile phone whenever I go shopping. Uh, you'll always see me with my earbuds in, and I'm almost always listening to My Favorite Murder because it's like two people having a conversation. So I just can just listen to a conversation. And it's really funny, and it's completely inappropriate. Um, and they say really bad words. And they cover real, true crime, and I'm a true crime fan, so it works out. Uh, so there's like a lot of ambient noise. I still get scrambled, and I end up in bed for part of the day. Or um, I helped a friend move recently. Um, and the end of the day of moving day, I, I broke down a little bit cause I was stuttery and, and just overwhelmed. Um, that still happens. So people are going to say that, you know, they were selfish. Well, kind of, yeah, in a way, but also not really. Um, their life has irrevocably changed like a light switch, right? Like that, right? Um, they went from walking, talking, feeding themselves, you know, um, not um, stumbling on words. And it, it's not stumbling on words like you're trying to find, find the right word for effect or emphasis. It's just, I can't recall that word. Or... I see the word in front of me, but I can't recognize the word. 
or with aphasia, your brain has just stolen the fucking word and it ain't coming back. Um, or with the verbal apraxia, you start stuttering or, or making like vowel forming sounds. Um, you know, kind of like Hannibal Lecter looking for some fava beans and a good Chianti. Right? So, um, <clears throat> it's just, it's difficult. Right? And in the mental health aspect post stroke, um, it is, is vastly overlooked and underestimated because, well, you look fine. I've always been exactly this ugly. Yes, always been this ugly. It's never going to change. Occasionally I get furry in the face. Occasionally I don't. Um, you know, uh, so people, people, because they can't see the damage, right? Um, so if you had had a heart attack, right, um, you go for the surgery, and then you might be physically winded, you know, you might, you might take some time to rebuild your strength. That's similar, but drastically different. Because there's days where my brain and my body still don't get along. And I can't predict them, I can't control them, I try to fight through them. So I can appreciate the difficulty your friend was having. Completely appreciate it. So you have to now grieve a friend that was in trouble. Um, you have to grieve a friend that was um, hurting, right? And it's something you can't really express because people just don't, uh, this is not to be insulting. You'll never understand unless you've been there. I have many friends that uh, I know through Facebook that have had strokes. Um, some are in the States, some are in Canada, some are in England, right? We all have our own unique deficits and difficulties post-stroke. Uh, so, and none of them are the same. Some of them are kind of similar, but they're all a little bit different. So, your friend was going through a very tumultuous time. Um, I believe you're in the States just because you mentioned trigger because um, it's almost impossible to get a hold of a firearm in Canada now. Uh, and if they believed she was suicidal, they would have ordered them taken away. So um, it, it's, it's difficult, right? There, there isn't an effective safety net in a mental health aspect post-stroke. You can look at your doctor straight in the face and go, I need a psychiatrist. And they'll just refuse to send you to one. Like, I know what I'm doing. I'm I'm more qualified. I'm just going to ignore. I'm, I'm going to sign a form saying you're going to a psychiatrist, but then I'm never going to do it. Um, yeah, I found that out the hard way. <laughs> yeah. I have PTSD because of the stroke. I have anxiety attacks. When I look at job adverts, because I just get scared to shit of going for a job and, and being treated the same way and, and by anyone in an employment sense, um, you know, uh, I still have screwed up sleep. Um, there's a whole, I, I have a whole bunch of issues going on. This is a hot mess express on a bad day. So your friend was going through their post-stroke journey and it's difficult and it's it's hard for people to relate because people will look at me and go hey well you you're, you're much better now and i'm like well kind of um and i'm just gonna be honest unless you've actually take the time to check your agenda and your opinions at the door and actually listen to this person who's had the brain injury, you're still not going to get it. Um, cause I don't feel that I have aphasia or I become overwhelmed by fluorescent lights and ambient noise. I have that. That's a neurological thing. I don't feel that I have neurological fatigue. I have neurological fatigue. It's a thing. Like, so it's, these aren't feelings. These are these are states of being, right? And they're transient and they're not predictable. Um, I can still have a high startle response. And and knowing some of what I've been through and some of my 
fellow stroke folk have been through. You can only imagine what your friend went through. Um, so yeah, have I been suicidal after a stroke? Yes, most definitely. Um, have I been required to see a psychiatrist? Yep. I have a small bag of medications that are like two thirds issued by my psychiatrist. The rest are issued by my GP. Um, I need a pill to sleep. I need, I need um, antidepressants when I get up. I have Ativan for really fucking bad days. Um, my weighted blanket is still the best thing ever. Um, and, and I'm not the uh, the best exemplar of what good mental health looks like. Cause, <laughs> no, not at all. But what I can say is this, that is, if you are the stroke survivor or the brain injury survivor, and you get to a spot where you desperately need help, especially after watching this video, I need you to find someone immediately, hopefully in the same room or within 30 feet, and not a stranger, because that would get really awkward really quick. Walk up to them, grab them in a firm, all-around bear hug grasp, and tell them, I need help. I need you to take me to help. Let's go to the hospital, walk-in clinic, doctor's office, urgent care center. Right? Um, walk in your nearest fire station. Right? Um, you know, if there's no one near you and, and you're home alone right now, pick up your phone and, and dial the 911. Right? That's North America. Um, right? Britain, England, the UK, wherever else on the flat earth or the non-flat earth, right? Contact your emergency services. Um, if you live in, a, like in the province of Ontario, there is, there's CAMH. Um, there are various crisis lines. Um, you know, call your family doctor, call whoever, call your priest, your rabbi, your mom, Call your lawyer. They might be heartless, but they will get you help. Um, yeah, Artie, throwing shade at you. Same to you, Mike. They know who they are. Um, so, call someone, because this, is this again, is not a suffer in silence situation. This is if you need something, say something, because you're fighting for your life. And, and as shitty as it is, you're fighting for your life, right? Uh, if, if you are someone who's supporting the stroke survivor, uh, be it a friend, family member, spouse, child, what have you, and you notice that person is on their chin strap, like they are just mentally circling the drain, it's going to be blunt. Talk to them. You are not going to cause a death by openly, honestly talking about suicide. It, it's statistically a fact, right? Um, talking about it is not causing it. Let me just say that again for those in the back that missed it. Talking about it is not causing it, right? Because then you can gauge, is this a serious, oh fuck, we need to go right now situation? Or we have time to sort of talk about it and, and pick it apart and get you help at a little bit more leisurely pace, right? Because if this is an immediate need, you need to go, right? You need to go right now to the hospital, the 911, the fire station, right? Whatever. So I've been lucky. Um, I've had friends. Uh, my ex-girlfriend, uh, the um, the fruit cocktail crew, you know who you are. Oh, yes, you know who you are, um, that have uh, been there for me when I've been hospitalized, either by my own accord or due to a form. Um, it's not easy to talk about such a delicate topic, and I'll be actually quite surprised if YouTube keeps this video up. I'm not advocating in any way that you enter into an act of self-harm or, or, or causing your own death. I'm not 
suggesting in any way you enter into an activity of self-harm or eventually causing your own death. I'm saying this, if you are in a position where you are having ideation, you, um, which means thinking, right? Um, you're, you're ruminating about the 953 ways to do yourself in, right? Um, if you are committing to gestures or other acts, like you recently went out and bought a knife or rope, or you recently got a, a certain prescription refilled, or you went and bought some street drugs, right? Because that's your plan, right? Like if you actually have a plan, um, that's a good indicator that you need help now. Uh, planning, like actual, actual planning is a good indicator you need help. Someone who has an active plan needs help. You yourself, the individual, and the person need to go get yourself help. And if you are someone other than the stroke survivor and you find these things out, don't panic. Not time for dramas. Just say, okay, I understand. We need to do things to help you, right? No judgments, no dramas, like no hurries, no worries. Just go get the help. So I realize this is a pretty um, difficult and heady topic. Uh, I realize that I've been away for a while. I've kind of told you some of the reasons why. We'll get into other reasons why later. Um, it's difficult. And I, I've kind of been there. Um, I still have bad days. I'm, I'm not going to try to hide it. I'm not even going to try to argue it. I still have very, very difficult days. Um, I'm here. I'm not planning on going anywhere just immediately. Besides, it's COVID. I can't... Where are you going to go to? My phone detects a workout when I go to the store. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so if you've been liking what you've been watching, please like, share, subscribe. If you know someone who appears to be stumbling on their mental health, show them this video. And I will leave a link in the description down below for the video that provoked this response. So... If you happen to see someone who's who's stumbling madly off in all directions with their mental health, it's just a conversation. It's not. It's not anything difficult, right? And 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 simplification statements like, oh, just be happy. Try to be not hungry. Yeah, try that. Why not? Try to be not hungry, right? It, it's, it, 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 again, you have to do something to satiate that, that need for food, um, you know, orange Fanta and pickle potato chips. That's my go-to suggestion. So, um, I'm not responsible for indigestion, right? No, uh, so it, it's, it, it's a very, it will be a very delicate and difficult conversation, but it's just a conversation. And then you can gauge how much help that person needs or not. You can help them get them to help. And if you like what you've been watching, please like, share, subscribe. If you happen to see either in yourself or someone around you the signs or symptoms of a stroke, such as someone who's immediately lost a sense of balance, um, they immediately become befuddled. Um, they have uh, eye vision, eye issues, difficulty with their vision. They can't see it in one eye. They only see in grayscale. They see it like a little dot in the world. Um, someone who has facial droop, there's a noticeable slackening of the facial muscles. One side of their face will be droopy. Um, someone who can't raise their arms equally effectively or at all. Uh, someone who has uh, speech problems. 
Um, they can't understand speech. They have slurred, stuttering speech. Uh, they have in the inability to uh, form words, uh, right? That sounds kind of awkward, but all of those things can happen. Um, they, uh, they can't stand unaided. They have general body weakness or weakness on one side. Please immediately place that person person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.